Welcome everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this next and, and final installation of the summer series, The Ideas Made to Matter. Uh, my name is Ezra Zuckerman Sivan. I am MIT Sloan's uh, Associate Dean for uh, Teaching and Learning. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the series and I'm going to introduce you to Retsef Levy. So as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to disrupt our communities, industries, and economies on a global scale, it's creating new challenges and uncertainty for global business leaders and for us all. With this in mind, uh, we have invited MIT Sloan faculty members to come together and share with us their latest research and insights in this series. Uh, we've been exploring the direct implications of the global pandemic, as well as non-coronavirus topics, uh, as well as their interrelations. I think you'll agree that MIT and MIT Sloan are uniquely positioned to address the challenge of this moment across every dimension, from healthcare to finance, workplace policy to supply chain management, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and beyond. And so in this series, uh, we've been hopefully providing you with an opportunity to, direct, to hear directly from faculty solving these issues in real time and reaffirming why research at MIT Sloan matters in this world. So now it's my privilege and my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Retsef Levy. Retsef is the J. Sp Spencer Standish, 1945, Professor of Management in the Operations Management Group here at MIT Sloan. He joined our faculty in 2006, uh, having received his PhD at Cornell, uh, and then a postdoc at IBM. Uh, Retsef is the faculty co-director for the Leaders for Global Operations program. Uh, Retsef's research focuses on the design of analytical data-driven decision support models and tools addressing complex business and de system design decisions under uncertainty, in areas such as health and healthcare management, supply chain, procurement, uh, supply chain pro procurement and inventory management, revenue management, pricing optimization, and logistics. Whew, I'm glad I got through that. Let me just say for a second, a little more, more importantly, at least to me personally. So I've been uh, Sloan's deputy dean the last five years, and it has been really been one of the great pleasures um, of my uh, time and to get to know Retsa in various roles that Retsa plays. Let me just say, there is no one in MIT Sloan faculty who plays a more diverse set of teaching, research, and um, service roles than Retsef does, and does so extraordinarily well. And in particular, right now, he is leading, uh, the, um, uh, together with Bill Garrett and some others, the health and safety uh, work stream uh, associated with our op um, reopening the campus this fall. Um, and this is uh, really just an incre incredible service to the school incredible learning opportunity for me. Let me just say one other thing before. Retsev has, has, has uh, shown himself on video, which means he wants to get going. But I'll just say, um, Retsev is an um, incredibly collaborative colleague. Um, and so you'll hear a little bit about the work he's doing in a, um, in a second on food safety and food supply chain. Some of that is part of the, uh, um, the food uh, sa uh, what is it? Sa safety and sensing um, initiative. He'll tell, say something about that. Um, but it just, there is no one at Sloan also who collaborates with the most with the diversity of faculty and staff that Retsef does and does so effectively. And so it's it's a great pleasure to introduce you to Retsef, to welcome him, and for him to share with us today some of his research efforts focused on food safety and the food supply chain that was of, of utmost importance pr um, prior to COVID, and it certainly is of great importance to us, to us today in the context of the COVID pandemic. Retsef, take it away. So thanks, Ezra, for uh, this kind introduction. Uh, I uh, I hope we can uh, keep the compliments about uh, leading the effort to reopen the, the the school also at the end of the semester. But uh, it has been a journey so far, and I'm I'm fortunate to also be uh, partnering with you and others on on that journey. Uh, let me share my slides and and get to the uh, talk today. Okay, so. The, the, the theme of today's talk uh, is really uh, uh, about the impact that food supply chains have on uh, public health and some of the some major risks that uh, food supply chains uh, bring about the uh, public health and what might be uh, new ways to think and mitigate and manage those risks. Um, I'm going to talk about a glimpse of a body of work that, uh, and, a, and a range of problems that are global and local 
um, but hopefully give you enough uh, sense of the importance and, and hopefully also the promise of what can be done. And um, Ezra mentioned that uh, I typically work with others, so uh, this work in particular, and I'm going to try and, and, and highlight that at some point very explicitly, but let me even at the, at the get going just say that this has been uh, or this is the output of work of a lot of faculty from different schools at MIT, um, different uh, parts of the school, of the Sloan School, PhD students, research scientists, and actually also many international collaborators. Um, and th the first thing that I want to talk about is to really highlight some of the intersections between uh, food supply chains and human health. And uh, let me start with the most obvious uh, connection, which is, well, we all need to eat. Uh, and food is something that is essential for well-being and life. Uh, and at the same time, highlight the fact that um, we have some uh, interesting uh, phenomena in our food supply chains globally, that on one hand, there is a lot of waste, but at the same time, uh, there are uh, more than 700 million people currently worldwide living in hunger. Um, Another impact that food supply chains have on uh, human health, and, uh, and we're going to talk about the, the, this particular aspect quite a bit today, is the aspect of food safety and food adulteration, namely uh, all the things that can happen to the food that makes it actually unhealthy to eat or consume. Um, and even here, uh, it, it, the impact is tr dramatic and tremendous in size and, and scope. Uh, we, um, it's estimated that we are talking about 600 million illnesses that are caused because of contamination of food uh, and, and more than 420,000 deaths, uh, many of which are uh, actually of young kids uh, and children. Uh, food supply chains also have tremendous impact on the environment. Uh, and it's actually a two-sided uh, impact, if uh, one, would, uh, uh, one would say. Uh, on one hand, uh, the, the footprint, the environmental footprint of agriculture supply, supply chains is tremendous. Uh, in fact, more than 25% of the greenhouse emissions are due to agriculture supply chains. Uh, at the same time, the environment and environmental changes and climate change affect in very significant ways uh, on the productivity uh, of, and the safety of food supply chains. And finally, and, and maybe quite relevant uh, to the recent uh, months, um, it's fair to say that um, food supply chains and agriculture supply chains are the source of a lot of what is called zoonotic diseases. These are diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans. And what you can see here are some primary examples of those uh, kind of epidemics. Uh, COVID-19 is the current uh, uh, thing that we all face but uh, by no means the first uh, zoonotic diseases outbreak uh, that has uh, hit the world or parts of the world in rather significant ways. Um, so today we are not going to talk about all of these aspects. Uh, we're going to focus particularly on the issues of food safety and adulteration and how it might be connected to the risk of zoonotic diseases. And uh, the common theme will be really how to leverage supply chain analytics and multidisciplinary field research to inform uh, both global and local policy. Uh, and I'm gonna focus particularly on China on work we, have, we are, um, are, are doing in China. Uh, first as an example, but also because China, as uh, you already know from the COVID case, is a source uh, of a lot of food that comes to the world. And also, unfortunately, also a source of uh, some of the zoonotic diseases outbreaks that we've, we've been seeing in the last several decades. But it's also at the same time a big a consumer of food, maybe the largest consumer of food. Um, but that said, everything that I would say uh, has implications uh, more globally and uh, probably many of the issues that I'm talking about are relevant to a lot of developing and developed countries. So I, I wanna start next by introducing uh, some uh, basic concepts that will allow us to understand uh, some of the issues in, in, in more details later on. Um, and when we talk about food safety and food adulteration, this is the activity of uh, the food being contaminated. Um, we, as a public, the most significant window that we have to this topic is through uh, public scandals and incidents of food contamination or food adulteration. So if I think about China, perhaps the most uh, significant and well-known uh, incident is the melamine incident uh, in which um, farmers and brokers in the dairy supply chain 
uh, contaminated milk by adding to it a poison that is called melamine with the intention to increase the perceived protein level in the milk based on some economic motives. And as a result, this said contaminated milk ended up in baby's formula and caused uh, serious uh, injuries and, and deaths to thousands of uh, kids and children and babies in China. Uh, but if you think that uh, food safety and nutrition issues is just a, a problem of developing countries, uh, well, in the US, we have uh, our own share of uh, food safety scandals and maybe one one particular incident that uh, I, I suspect some of you may remember is the big outbreak uh, of uh, foodborne illnesses in uh, one of our most uh, um, well-known uh, restaurant chain, Chipotle, uh, that also caused uh, quite a lot of uh, injuries and harm, uh, not to mention the economic uh, damage. Now, uh, this is the more, most typical window that the public uh, has to food safety, but I also want to highlight uh, more of the regulatory perspective. And just uh, do that by quoting two facts uh, that maybe will give you a sense of the scale of the problem. So the Federal Drug Administration in the US is responsible to inspect every import of food that comes into the US and decide whether it's safe to bring it in to the, to the country. And at the moment, the US FDA has to uh, face with over 40 million annual unique food lines that are important to the, to the United States with the ability to essentially uh, inspect only 1% uh, of those uh, shipments. And that tells you the scale of the problem and, and basically tells you that if, unless you have a very good way to prioritize risk, it's going to be very hard for you to manage uh, this domain and this activity. And indeed, there has been a lot of industry work and federal uh, 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 legislation in the US over the last 10 years around how to think about those types of risk. China is, again, uh, another gigantic country. We're going to talk more about that. But just to, again, give you the scale of the problem, uh, it's, it's, a, it's really mind-boggling and, and very, uh, very central to essentially every government uh, or most governments uh, across the world, whether it, it's, a, it's a developing countries or developed countries. OK, so the two, the two scenarios that we saw, the two incidents that we just saw, represent in, in some way the, the scope of uh, food adulteration that we typically see, where uh, on one hand, uh, the Chipotle case uh, can be viewed as an anti unintentional adulteration, namely uh, a scenario in which the contamination of the food is not intentional, but maybe as the result of negligence or not having the, uh, good practices. Uh, the other extreme, is uh, what we call bioterrorism or terror motives uh, to attack the, the food supply chain. And perhaps the uh, example of the melamine in China is what we call economically motivated adulteration, where the intentional aspect exists, namely these adulteration activities are done intentionally, but the motive is not ter terror, but rather uh, potential benef uh, economic benefits or financial gains. And what is interesting about this middle scenario is that in order to understand it and assess the risk uh, uh, emerging from uh, that, those type of activities, you really need to integrate many, many aspects and perspectives that could be quite different from a technical perspective, how the food is man manufactured, what are the in in commercial incentives in the supply chain and in the market, what are the current testing capabilities, what is the structure of the supply chain and so forth and so forth. So actually, uh, it's, it's a pretty challenging task to fully understand and uh, even more challenging to actually put together systems that can uh, effectively and proactively manage those types of risks. Okay. So that leads me to um, talk about uh, some work that we've been doing in China over the last uh, four years. Uh, it's a project that is funded by the Walmart Foundation uh, that launched in 2016 uh, Food Safety Collaboration Center uh, in China and uh, basically chose our team to be one of the first two uh, grantees of the center based on our prior work in the US with the US FDA uh, on food safety. And this has been a long journey over the last four years. And I think that before I talk about the details of some of the work that we've been doing, I want to highlight uh, some of the unique organizational aspects of this work and start with the MIT team. Uh, the MIT team uh, really involves 
uh, faculty from multiple groups in the MIT Sloan School of Management, spanning disciplines that uh, starts from uh, machine learning, supply chain management, regulatory science, economics, uh, and, and so forth, but also involve other faculty from the other two schools of, uh, other two schools, additional two schools at the MIT, the School of Engineering and the School of Sciences. Um, and the collaboration is actually international, where we currently actively collaborate with five different organizations in China that never collaborated uh, before, uh, but started to collaborate and work with us uh, uh, during this project. Uh, and, and these organizations include universities, research institute, and private companies. Um, now, um, just to make the point, this is very much a project that until COVID-19, was very much done on the ground in China. So these collaborations on the right hand side, the picture, uh, you see ac actually a research meeting taking a place in China uh, with PhD students, faculty, uh, postdocs from MIT together with colleagues in China, uh, about 40 people in the room doing research about food safety in China. Uh, what you see in the picture in the middle, um, you see actually the head of the CF Chinese CFDA uh, in, in of Shenzhen uh, in, in a um, in a conference in Shenzhen, and um, we got to speak there. And and on the bottom, you see uh, some of us. Uh, you, you see uh, my colleague Yesheng uh, uh, from the Sloan faculty uh, being uh, touring horses markets and wet markets in China. So uh, this has been a, a exciting. But let me tell you a little bit more. Uh, about some of the work that we, we, are, we are doing and some examples of what, what we can learn uh, from this work. So the first thing I want to talk about is a major effort that we've been uh, engaged in uh, over the last several years to build a very unique data set uh, employing a, and leveraging a lot of uh, advanced analytics and machine learning. Uh, the data that we are talking about is publicly available data of uh, food product test records that the China FDA is putting in the public domain. In China, surprisingly, there is a law that mandates the China FDA to post all test results of food products in the public domain. What is the challenge? The challenge is that the regulatory environment in China is extremely distributed and fragmented. So this data currently resides on, or in, on, in over uh, 400 websites uh, of different organizations, starting with the central CFDA, the state level CFDA, that is actually a more structured database. But then each province and each prefecture in China uh, is posting its own tests in a completely different uh, uh, standard, uh, in different formats, in an unstructured way, and so forth and so forth. Uh, what we were able to do is to create an automated process that essentially gathered the data from almost all of these websites and structure it in a harmonized unified database that currently has more than 4 million test records, uh, basically uh, mining over 60,000 files and 15,000 unique data tables and structures. Uh, and let me say a little bit more about what that entails, because th this actually required the development of a range of machine learning tools to be able to do that with a team of two people. That's the team that actually maintains this, this, data, this database that is unique in the world. Nobody has that database, even not the Chinese government. Um, so let me just give a few examples of what does it entail. So what you see on the left hand side, this is going to be raw data. That's kind of how we start with. And on the right side, right hand side, you're going to see what the algorithms that we developed are able to create. So the first example on the top here is a, a, a test that uh, was conducted in a supermarket uh, in some city in China. And again, it's being written in free text. Uh, our algorithms can actually figure out the supply chain location that it was done in a retailer chain, but also the city uh, in which it was conducted. Uh, the second example in the middle, you see there a food name that is small yellow crocker, which is a product category that is called aquatic product. That's a, that's a type of fish. The uh, algorithms that we developed are able to harmonize that into the right pr uh, product category and identify that that's an aquatic product that's on the right hand side. And finally, the last example is a failed test uh, and the algorithms that we developed can actually understand that the test was failed, but also understand what, what other trends were identified in that, in that test. Okay, so, and we can do that at scales, as, you, as, you, as I mentioned, for over 4 million records and there are many other complications that you have to 
uh, deal with in order to actually create such a database. So what does it buy you? What, what such database buys you? Uh, and let's just uh, take an example, the uh, freshwater aquatic supply chain in China. That's a very high risk product because Chinese uh, tend to uh, consume uh, fish like, like some other products and buy them alive. Uh, and it's a good example to actually highlight some of the uh, complexities of the, of the agriculture and food supply chain in China. So from the left here, uh, we start with farms. And unlike the US and other developed countries, the farming supply chain in China is highly, highly fragmented to millions of very small household-based farms uh, that each one, each one of them raises a very little uh, uh, fraction of the supply. So highly fragmented, go through uh, a very complex uh, network of brokers, uh, either directly to manufacturers or through, uh, again, another unique aspect of the food supply chain in China, something that is called horses markets, uh, this is a very large market that is a distribution uh, point that from that distribution point, uh, the food can go either to secondary market or wet markets that are more consumer facing, or again, through more brokers to the end, uh, end points that includes restaurants, retail stores, and so forth. And uh, we're going to go back to some of these aspects uh, in, in a second, but let me just uh, talk about one particular aspect, which is uh, some of the tests that are conducted in uh, by the China FDA um, are done a lot in retailer stores, and I'm going to talk about it in, in, a, in just a bit. But what we wanted to ask is not where the test is conducted and fails, for example. We wanted to actually understand where the risk is introduced in the supply chain. So going from where this risk is being discovered to where the risk is being originated. And let me just give an example. Let's say that I tested the product in the uh, retail store and I found their residues of uh, illegal antibiotics. The likely source of that will be the farm. However, if I found uh, a, a dye that is used for, uh, for coloring the, the processed product, it's more likely to come from the manufacturer. So again, using our database and analytics that allows you to do that at scale to all the test records in the, in the database, we're able to identify the risk sources. So based on our analysis, we say, hey, 30 to 40% of the risk that you find in, in, let's say, retailer stores is coming from bad practices of, at the manufacturer site. And between 40 to 53% comes from farming practices and then some of it comes from the environment, as we talked about the environment does impact food safety, and some of it comes from the circulation part uh, in the supply chain. And uh, why, does, why does this matter, right? Uh, it, it, in order to see why it matters, it's important to actually understand what the CFDA and how the CFDA tests at the moment, right? Uh, so in order to do that, um, what I want to do is to highlight another important point in the supply chain, which is basically the centrality of horses markets. Uh, horses markets are very unique to the China supply chain and to some other developing countries. Again, what is unique about them, that they are really serving as a major consolidation points for many product categories. Uh, fresh aquatic products is one of them. And essentially 80% of the supply that is generated by these very highly fragmented uh, farms is going through the horses markets and then being distributed uh, mostly through wet markets, about 63%. Some of it goes to restaurants, a little bit goes to retail stores, and some goes to manufacturers. Now, now I'm coming to what the uh, China FDA and where the China FDA is testing, because I have the data of what tests were conducted, we can actually see what is the fraction of testing resources allocated to different supply locations that we have here. And what uh, is clear that the vast majority of tests are conducted first at retailer stores and then uh, in manufac at manufacturer sites. And to some extent, that already stands in contradiction to the fact that 63% of the flow times 80% actually does not go through these channels. It actually goes through horses markets, through uh, secondary and wet markets. Now, this is becoming even more interesting, right? When you actually look on the failure rates of these tests, how, how, what fraction of these tests is actually failing? 
And you actually see that where the, the, the China FDA currently tests are the places where actually the failure rate is lower than the other supply chain locations where the failure rate is actually higher. Now, what are the insights that come out of this? We basically uh, already have a very major insight that the current policy of the China FDA is to test close to the consumer rather than to test close to the source of where the problems are. And that they are currently neglecting in their approach, both horses markets and wet markets where a lot of the risk is actually uh, uh, happening. And moreover, another importance of the horses market is to actually uh, be a place where you can actually create transparency in the supply chain. If you actually think about one of the major challenges in the Ch China supply chain, it's not only that it's very big and fragmented, but the immediate result of that is that it's very hard to know where the food is coming from. And if you want to monitor 100, you know, millions of millions of farms, or very small farms, that's gonna be a very hard task. If you want to actually focus on about 5,000 horses markets, large horses markets that consolidate 80% of the supply in China, that's a much more doable task. So this is an insight, that's analysis. Okay, how we translate that to actions, to driving solutions. Uh, so one of the things that we currently do is we actually working with the, we, we're starting to work currently with the horses market in China to basically develop a new management scheme to manage horses markets in China from creating transparency to the sources, to create transparency to where, what the buyers are. And also, uh, and that's part of the work that our colleagues in the engineering school and the science schools are doing, develop rapid testing capabilities that are much more specific and general than what we currently have in, in available that will allow you to actually provide solutions to the specific environment of the horses market in which uh, the logistical conditions are very challenging, but also the food is moving through very, very quickly. And just to tell you what informs this work, what informs this work is extensive field survey that we conducted with our uh, collaborators in China, in which we actually uh, surveyed uh, more than 100 horses markets, aquatic horses markets in China, in three of the major agriculture provinces in China. And this is perhaps the most extensive uh, feed server that was ever done. It included both the uh, managers of the horses markets as well as the vendors of the horses markets. And it, it used uh, to inform a lot of the work that we currently do to uh, develop and, and, and the, the solutions that we hope to hopefully pilot uh, in one of the markets in China in the next year. So we are moving from an insight to actually now develop solutions uh, and using a lot of the analytical tools that we developed for, on which I don't have time to talk about today, actually to bring them to bear uh, in building this system. And just to close on that uh, particular uh, issue, it's fair to say that um, the, the, um, the, um, the, the work that we we're doing is actually very aligned with the policy uh, trends in, the UN, in China. Uh, and these are some examples of recent announcements of policy organizations, central policy organizations in China uh, that are focusing on risk-based analytics, uh, as well as specifically talking about the need to uh, strengthen the management of horses market. So to some extent, our work uh, was even pioneering that approach and maybe in, in, in some ways informed some of the trends that we are currently see in terms of the policy in China. Okay. So that leads me to basically the connection to zoonotic diseases. Uh, and uh, uh, you all heard about COVID and that the hypothesis that COVID or was originated from an aquatic product, a, a horses market in Wuhan. Uh, in fact, SARS, the previous epidemic, big epidemic that came out of China, uh, that was also zoonotic disease, was actually associated with wet and horses markets in Shenzhen. So in, uh, overall, uh, they, this is just two examples of other zoonotic diseases that are all associated with horses and wet markets. So the question that we wanted to ask is whether there is some correlation between zoonotic diseases risks coming out of horses markets and food safety and adulteration risks that come from horses markets. And why would we even think that that might be relevant? Uh, it's because the hypothesis that the underlying root causes of these uh, problems 
all stem from common uh, structural and environmental environmental deficiencies in how these uh, horses markets are managed. And uh, what, what is the importance of that? The importance of that is that the government in China has invested quite a lot in, in better understanding food safety risk, and there is quite a lot of data on that. There is much less data on zoonotic diseases risks. So if we can actually learn something about the risk of zoonotic diseases from food safety, uh, that will give us already a, a good starting point to leverage existing data that is available to us. So what, do we, what did we do? Um, I'm not going to get into the details, but let me just take you through some of the steps that you need to work out in order to even start thinking about that. So the first thing is when you need to identify in the database that we add all the uh, records of animal products that were tested in horses markets or were sourced from horses markets, right? The, the, pro the second problem is that you need to take each one of these records and know how to associate it with an ex a specific individual market. Uh, how do you do that? In a second, I will explain. Uh, once you do that, you can actually create a market risk score that will be essentially one way to think about it is the failure rate of the test conducted in that, that uh, risk score. And then you can leverage that risk score to actually create uh, from a market risk score to create a province level risk scores. Specifically, let's say, looking on how many or what volume of product is being sold through very high risk uh, markets. And finally, you can uh, try and, and see if there is some, any correlation or association between those uh, risk, province level risk scores and uh, how many uh, isolates of uh, flu, zoonotic flu isolates, namely flu variants that come from animals uh, were detected in those provinces. Just to give you a sense of the second step, so how do you actually associate records with specific markets? That is actually a pretty hard problem because the, all, the, all of this is being done in free text in Chinese. That's actually uh, something that there are very little machine learning tools that currently uh, are very effective. We had to develop very specific tools that actually leverage the structural a lang a structure of the language of, China, of Chinese, as well as specifically the structure by which they name markets. But we were able actually to create, uh, using machine learning, a very accurate way to uh, associate records with markets. Uh, and then we were able to run a regression uh, that actually controls for a lot of uh, confounding uh, variables and does support the uh, initial hypothesis that there is some significant association between food safety risks and um, zoonotic disease risk. And that actually was validated by additional analysis that we did. So with that, I want just to summarize uh, and, and just hopefully I gave you some, some flavor of uh, how analytics can be leveraged to inform regulatory work and policy work in the space of food safety and really al allow to uh, guide a resource allocation in a more risk-based manner. Uh, analytics is one piece of it. You need to combine it with technology and other aspects to create transparency in the supply chain. And finally, there is a very promising and interesting connection between food safety risk and the risk of zoonotic diseases that is very much in on front of the mind of everybody currently in the world. So we believe that that's maybe a promising avenue to start developing more robust risk management approaches to also manage that, that type of risk. Uh, before I conclude, let me just say that this is just the tip of the ice of a broad uh, range of efforts and work that we have in the school by many, many faculty uh, in uh, addressing different aspects of food supply chains and food related issues. Uh, and recently we formalized those efforts into a new initiative that is called the Food Supply Chain Analytics and Sensing Initiative. Uh, I have, I'm fortunate to be one of the leaders of that initiative, but it involves many other faculty. This is the new website that we have, and I'm going to be happy to engage uh, with anybody that wants to see how they can get engaged with this uh, initiative. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm happy to uh, and look forward to the discussion with Ezra and others. Thank you, Retsef. That was um, really, really um, uh, interesting and important and uh, inspiring, I would say. Uh, so I've got a few questions for you uh, before we get to, and I'll include, uh, I want to take a moment also to encourage uh, folks who are on the call. I see there's a few questions and one was just added, and I'll um, do my best to incorporate them into um, our discussion. I wanted, to, before we get into some of the questions are getting specific in terms of the research that you're doing, but I want to take a step back before we get there. 
in two ways. So um, the first question I want to ask you is, can you, can you give us a little more context about how this work that you're doing uh, with your collaborators fits into your past work? So I'm curious, how did food safety come onto your radar screen? Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, was it the importance of the problem that all of a sudden became clear to you? Was it the opportunity of applying, um, you know, advanced analytics? Was it what was it, you know intellectually intriguing about it? How, you know, how did that come about? Yeah. So um, I, I don't think that was this was mentioned in the introduction, but uh, it's fair to say that academia is my second career. I spent almost twelve years in the Israeli military as an intelligence officer. So essentially, from age eighteen, in different settings, I'm thinking about risk and how to think about risk and. Um, the first time I heard about the range of problems uh, related to food safety, safety was uh, uh, in a visit of uh, senior um, leaders of the US FDA coming to MIT and looking for uh, potential projects with MIT strategic projects. And they described to me uh, this problem of how to uh, decide how to test 40 million, uh, what, what out of 40 million uh, unique shipments to test. And to me, it immediately strikes me that this is an intelligence problem, that I have something that I know about that. Um, and that was kind of the starting point. We put together a team that was multidisciplinary. And then at that point, I didn't know more than just told me about food safety. Um, and six, seven years later, um, the more I learned about that, I suddenly realized that so many lives uh, depend on that. And the problems are so global and local in the sense that there are some global impacts here and global interrelationship as, low, as well as lo local aspects that are unique to each locality that makes the problem so rich and important uh, that without uh, the ability to integrate not only analytics, but also other aspects like economics, regulatory understanding, uh, biomanufacturing, uh, it's, it's very hard to come, to come uh, with any reasonable solution. And there is no place better than MIT. And that's the fortunate fact that you're at MIT. You can reach out to experts in all of these areas and people are also willing to work together. So that became a very exciting gen uh, journey that I'm still in, in the middle of it, but um, I, I'm just feel fortunate to to be able to work with so many people that bring so many perspective uh, to the to try and solve a very hard set of problems. So another piece of context um, I was curious about, and this relates to at least one of the questions I see here, and which is so I remember the first time I heard about this. Uh, I think it was a meeting with you and um, and Yasheng Wang uh, at some point. In that process, I got to meet Stacy Springs too, who works with you, and I was very skeptical that you would be able to pull this off. I thought the Chinese government's going to let a bunch of MIT faculty into China and uh, and investigate such a sensitive issue, and and then you know then hearing about all the, um, the partners involved, and so I was wondering, and you pulled it off <laughs> quite clearly. Uh, this relates, there's one question on here, I think this relates to it, which is uh, the CFDA level of sponsorship for the, for the report you're doing. But I, I, I think it would be really great for people to hear, uh, you know, it's not simply a new area of research that you're getting into, but, you know, the geopolitical implications of all this and the, and the partnerships, the sensitivities, uh, and this is even before COVID, like, you know, it's even more sensitive right now, obviously. And so, can you give us a sense of the challenges you were up against and how yeah. you dealt with them? Well, first, we're still up against. So clearly, the current political environment does not make our life easier. Um, let, let me say a few things about the China side and also a few things about the, the US side uh, or our MIT side. So I think that, um, first, just to clarify, the, the China government does not fund this project at the moment. It's being funded entirely by uh, the Walmart Foundation and other private funding uh, of or some of organizations in China, but 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 not the yeah, government. And you might say the Walmart Foundation is distinct from It's the distinct from the corporate funding. In fact, they work very hard to keep themselves distinct to the extent that they actually forbid you to work with the corporate with their money. Um, so the, the, the one thing that I was surprised in China that actually people in China are not shy of talking about those problems. And in fact, the government in China currently realizes that the two things that uh, threaten the stability of the government in China are food safety and environmental uh, uh, problems. Because they understand that if they don't solve those problems, they, they might lose the trust of the public. Uh, and I think that that trust is actually critical for the ability of, of such a government to survive in a big place like China. So for, from their perspective, they are motivated to solve the problem, I, I believe. 
Now, that doesn't say that they don't have sensitivities and you really need to, uh, there's some delicate uh, nuances of how you want to speak about it. If you come and you want to blame people and poke people eye, you're not going to be very successful. You can actually talk about the same substance in a constructive way that highlights problems and talk about solutions. And if you do that, I've yet, I've, I, we haven't seen too much resistance. In fact, there were times where we were raising concerns to our collaborators in China and said, no, there's no problem. We can write about that. Like, uh, th that's no, not a problem. Now, um, one thing I do want to say about MIT and, and the US approach, I think that, um, and I think that sometimes we have uh, maybe the flow that we think uh, when we come to MIT, to China, that we are going to come to teach the locals how to do research and how to do uh, everything. And I actually, I actually think that we adapted a very different approach from, uh, from the get going of being very humble, uh, being very collaborative and coming with a, with a conscious mind that we come to learn, not only to teach. And that had paid off of building trust, which is a critical thing in China. And it, it goes it, it goes through a range of things, including from symbolic things that you come to the room and Chinese, of course, organize the room that they treat you like, oh, you are the MIT professor. They put you at the head of the table, the MIT on one side and the Chinese on one side. And one of the things that I did was I, I went and immediately sat in the middle of all the Chinese seats. And I said, like, in this team, we are all mixed together. There are no, there are no MIT and like, we, we're going to work on this together. There are no ranks. And, and I, I think that that played a major role. Other than that, um, I find myself often in meetings when there are 40 people speaking Chinese and I'm among the, the handful of people that do not speak Chinese and you still need to understand this with translation. So there are also, also practical challenges, but this has been, um, this has been a, a journey uh, that, that I, I think that the key success driver was to come with the right approach of, of really wanting to collaborate on solving very hard problem and being willing to learn and respect the other side. Uh, I don't hear you, Ezra, you're muted. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, uh, there's a specific question you. about this and I have an Ezra, I don't hear you. Okay, you now, I hear you. Now, now I hear you, sorry. Hear. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a question here uh, about how did your team in access the data that is under government regulation? So I think that you, you basically answered that, right? So once you've had that- uh, Yeah, we, we, we were very, we, for example, I don't know if you saw that when we when we scrape a website, we only do that if it's allowed, we, we make sure that we don't violate any Chinese law. Uh, but this is, a, this is a valid concern. Uh, these policies change over time. And this is a risk that you take when you work in China, that you can wake up one day and there's some regulation that could uh, put you at risk that some of your research is uh, in, or the ability to continue to do your research is at risk. Um, we make sure that all the data that we collect is, has a copy in the US, but um, it's a valid risk. And I think ignoring it is, is gonna be naive. At the same time, here's my hope. My hope is these problems are just too important and central. They are not gonna go away and they can be solved all, only by collaboration. And they are not China problem only, they, they are global problem. So even in, 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 a, in times where tension is increasing for good and maybe for, for real and good and maybe for not so real and good uh, reasons. Um, and I'm not here to say that China is, is right. I, in fact, I, you know, I, I criticize a lot of the things that the China government is, is doing, but I think that we have to keep those collaboration going on those topics that actually, regardless of anything else, matter to all of us, people around the world, uh, and continue to work on that because I don't think that just governments will solve the problem. Academics and industry and private sector will have to lead the way. And, and they will lead the way through meaningful, respectful collaborations that are focused about really solving problems. So I'm curious, a couple of related questions. Um, one is, so you're talking about you're, you're you're being very humble and you're meeting with them, and I'm curious what is it that they or, or what you believe or they believe that you're bringing to the table that's that they can't um, they can't do on their own. I'm wondering in particular whether and maybe you could give um, uh, folks a, a sense of how important are um, advanced analytics and recent advances in analytics to this. Like, could you have done this five years ago? Um, given, you know, is it because of recent advances that you can do this or is, would you expect to be able to do something more five years from now? 
um, or is there some is there something else that's sort of your comparative advantage? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think that the so I think the, the big advantage of the Chinese side is the understanding of the local conditions and the ability to be on the ground, collect data, and really present the aspects, the local aspect. Uh, I think our, our ability was the ability to not only bring analytics, but the, bring the integration of analytics, testing the technology, biomanufacturing, understanding economics. These are uh, domains that even if you have skills in China, the academic world in China is not about integration. It's very kind of isolated. So our ability to, to bring the system thinking and the, and the integration of so all of these disciplines, of course, more advanced knowledge on analytics and other things, uh, was key, uh, and and then of course there is um, there's the ambitions, right? Like I think that we came with a very ambitious uh, agenda, and I think that that inspired some of our collaborators in China. And now we are in a journey where we feel that we are really changing the way uh, people like the wholesale market insight or how central wholesale markets are was not there five years ago. When we started, actually, the first reaction was, oh, you're wrong. That's not where the problem is. And now there is a consensus that that's a problem. Now the government in China is recognizing that two, three years later. So uh, it has been, uh, um, again, it took a few years to build the, the common language. Um, now, whether whether more advances in, in analytics will uh, will help, maybe. But frankly speaking, and that's no, true not to food safety or food supply chains. I think that most of the problems in the world can be solved with basic analytics, with good questions and good data, rather than with uh, machine learning and deep learning. Deep learning and machine learning solves 3% of the problems in the world. The rest is being solved by other tools, but needs other things other than analytics to actually solve. So. I just want to, it's very interesting. I tend to agree with that. Um, it sounds like, and so that your ability to collaborate across MIT is really important to this. And then it sounds like the kind of the convening function that MIT plays often was same so like it was useful you were actually you were saying earlier putting people around the table who wouldn't otherwise come to you yeah i wonder though so one question i have is how the approach generalizes beyond china and i wonder like you might at some level paradoxically i wonder if it would be more challenging to, to accomplish something like this in the u.s um then um, in other words, doing it on the road when you're basically sort of a outsider and can put uh you know a can can it sort of be the neutral arbiter is maybe a little easier than it might be in the U.S. when that would be a t trickier role to play. So so for, um, I didn't have time to talk about, but we have a similar. I mean, not a not a food safety safety, but we have an effort in India with collaboration collaborators on the ground, and we have a faculty that leads things in in Indonesia. So. I think that we have more examples of Sloan faculty leading efforts uh, in different global settings. Um, you know, your question about the U.S. is interesting. Um, I want to believe that it's possible. I, I think that what makes it sometimes harder is, um, well, maybe people are not as willing to recognize that they need help all the time, that they can feel, hey, I, I, I can do it myself. Why do I need MIT? Um, but, but I think that there are examples of other areas where MIT plays a convening role on, on things in the US. So I want to believe that there is a vision and there is an important vision, an important agenda to pursue in the US, J just to name a few challenges in the US in the food space. So food deserts, like there are millions of people in the US that live in neighborhoods that don't have access to fresh vegetables and food uh, fruits. And at the same time, we are throwing away uh, a lot of fresh vegetables and food and as, as well as other food. So uh, the, the problems in food supply chains in, in, in the US are maybe different than China, but by uh, no means uh, do not exist. So um, we actually, for example, one of our uh, one of our work is with the local uh, department in the Mass in Massachusetts that uh, administered some of the stamp programs in, in Massachusetts. So I, I do think that the potential is there. It's just a matter of you know, one thing that led us to China is that we received the funding from the Warren Foundation because all of these projects require tremendous amount of resources. This is not traditional research that you do in your office. This is just going to the field, traveling, collaborating. It, 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 it just has so a by the way, I'll overhead of organization. One question here, how can individuals, organizations in the MIT Sloan community get involved with the research and support, involved with the research and support it? 
uh, you should definitely reach out to the Office of External Relations who's sponsoring this, Patsy Thompson and, and Lauren Watchkin in particular, uh, and we can definitely uh, get you in, get you involved uh, as, as you're interested. Let me let me turn to a couple more questions that are in, in the Q and A here. Um, that's it. Thank you. So a couple of them are about the models that you were showing. Or um, one of them is about adjusting. So how did you adjust for geographical uh, sensitive regulation variables, city variability, city countryside variability, seasonal, etc. I'll, I'll add a second question, which is, um, can you mention covariates that you controlled in the regression um, for the association to, to zoonotic diseases? Seems like a, a whole bunch of confounding factors. So those, those are some questions there. Yeah, so these are great questions. So um, I, I just gave a tip of the, and, and there's a lot of robustness analysis that goes to a paper that we are about to submit uh, very soon. But the, the, um, the major thing that we control for uh, were, were the production level of uh, live animals in, in the province as well as other things that uh, are, are, could, could vary among, among different, uh, um, among different uh, uh, provinces. Uh, this, is not, this is actually not the only analysis that we did. So for example, two other pieces of analysis that strengthen this conjecture, uh, we, we were actually, we were taking a specific markets that were known to be involved with zoonotic disease outbreaks, including the two recent markets in Wuhan and then in Beijing. If people remember, there was another outbreak of COVID-19 in, 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 around the market in Beijing. Actually, these markets are ranked high risk on our, on our ranking, naturally. The other thing that we did is we took the top 40 high risk markets in our list and we, took, we matched them with markets on the same area, on the same province with the same size that have a lower risk. And then we actually investigated how many news media stories there are that suggest some structural problems. And actually there was a, an overwhelming uh, larger number of stories on the high risk markets versus the uh, low risk markets, including specific mentioning of illegal uh, trading of uh, wild animals in those markets. So while I, I don't think that at this point we can claim causality, that's not our intention. Um, I think that there is a very interesting direction that also makes sense from, from a, if you understand how horses markets are currently managed in China and what could lead for both zoonotic diseases risk as well as food safety risk, it, it's not, it should not be completely surprising that there is some correlation here because the underlying root causes could be the same. So while I don't think that this analysis suggests causality, this analysis suggests that A, you can learn potentially from risk indicators on food safety about the risk of zoonotic diseases. And moreover, when you think about solutions, if you actually think about the problem of horses markets, you might actually want to think about these two problems in conjunction and come up with uh, better ways to manage horses markets that we manage both of those risks together because they all might stem from the same underlying root causes. So that's kind of where I think the importance of the, the, the analysis that we do, rather than to claim that this particularly caused that. That's, I don't think we have the data to be that, to make that such a strong of a conclusion. Thanks, Thanks for that clarification. Two more questions. So one just is a note here from Velma uh, Erdogan Haug saying that you should check out Singapore too. Um, oh, we are uh, talking actually now in, with Singapore. We are Singapore? already discussing. Okay. So thanks, thanks for this. Um, we got two related questions. Um, one from Chris McLeod, we both know. Hi, Chris. Yeah, hi, Chris. <laughs> uh, and from Lawrence Poster. And they're both asking about um, essentially how does food safety in the U.S. compare to China? Uh, how at risk are we? Um, Lawrence is asking, and, and what would you recommend there? And uh, I think Chris was asking, uh, sort of, you map the U.S. food supply chain. Do you think you would find a similar nexus as WSMs? What does that stand for? Is that uh, also markets. markets? Yes. Um, so, that would be a good place for testing. So similar kind of question. Yeah. So, okay, so just as a background, three years before we started the project in China, we actually worked in a project with the USFDA, which was mostly on imports management, risk management. And, and to some extent in the US, that's a big problem because a lot of what we eat is coming from abroad. You will be surprised. 90% of the seafood coming from abroad, 80% um, of honey, uh, and, 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 and so, so it's a tremendous amount of fraction food that comes from, from abroad. Clearly the US supply chain, food supply chain is very different, right? Uh, we have more vertically integrated large farms. We don't have too many small family owned farms. 
Uh, we have a much more centralized regulatory stru uh, structure. Um, that said, we do have major problems of food safety in the, in the US, and that's the reason why in 2011, there was a new federal act that called the Food Safety Modernization Act that basically uh, regulates the expectations as well as the authority of the FDA with respect to food regulation, and in, in many ways, parallel what is expected from the FDA and the industry in, pharmace in the pharmaceutical domain to the food domain. Uh, five, six, year, uh, eight years later, the USDA FDA only just now starting to operationalize this law because of all the challenges uh, to actually translate this uh, uh, work into, uh, into action. And one of the things that the USDA uh, struggled the most is how to use data and analytics to inform its, its work. And that's a very weak part, I can attest to that. That's a very weak part, the current a deputy commissioner uh, that actually came from Walmart and funded our was the, the decision maker to fund our project with Walmart Foundation became the deputy commissioner of the US FDA and works currently as a strategic effort to bring uh, smart food safety management uh, that is based on analytics to the US FDA. So yes, the challenges are different, but very, very significant in the US, uh, both among the government and the industry. So there's two quick questions here. One, I think, so one is about asking, it's from Andrew Bilski about data transformation challenges when using Chinese data sets and more about asking more about the machine learning test that will run. I wonder if this is a good opportunity just to sell people, which has come up in the past. Um, so you said the paper is going to be complete soon. I assume the information will be in the paper. Yes. And um, about, about the first part on the food supply chain is already accepted paper in management science, which is one of the top journals in in, in, in so my that's area. what I was going to say. Is like may, let's just make give people an opportunity. We can put it on the on the um, oh, yeah. website. If, I, I just need to check if there are any restrictions by the journals before you get accepted. Sometimes they they restrict what you can put in the public domain. But I think that some of it is on archive publicly. So I'm happy to I'm happy to share the links of what we Great. can. Thanks, Rebecca. There's a question here from uh, Anton uh, uh, Lesnicki. I'm pronouncing it right. Is there an intention to commercialize the research findings in the U.S. Uh, or is there a, basically there's is there a way to commercialize the, the findings or the commercial ventures that can benefit from the research? So I I think that uh, the food food and agriculture areas are area are industries that are thirsty for advanced analytics and technology and currently are very immature. Uh, given the the regulatory pressure that will exist in the U.S. and more broadly now by COVID, I actually think that that's an area that will uh, have an emerging set of uh, business opportunities for innovation, particularly around uh, analytics, but also other technologies like testing, rapid testing, uh, and other, um, uh, you know, creating supply chain transparency. Um, so, so this is, I actually expect that food tech, in fact, I, I was surprised to find out uh, about a year ago that we actually have a major, major club among our MBAs that is about uh, food tech and agriculture. Um, of more than 150 people across MIT. So I think that the students are also speaking in their, in their, in their feet and actually they, they recognize that as an emerging area. And I suspect that it just be, become more emerging and uh, not less given the recent developments that we had. So we're unfortunately out of time. Uh, there was a great question there that um, deserves a, a longer conversation about um, how the CFDA and China in general will approach the wholesale food markets. Let me take the opportunity. Red stuff, this was incredibly enlightening. Uh, like I can say inspiring and I think encouraging. Um, I want to thank you for sharing with us today um, and pleasure. encourage folks you know, to reach out uh, if you want to engage with the research more, to support it. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Patsy Thompson and Laura Watchkin, Lauren Watchkin for convening us, uh, for, for coordinating this, this series. It's been a great pleasure for me to be part of it. I've learned a tremendous amount from my colleagues um, and I'm happy to have been really, really I'm happy for the opportunity to engage with you in the wider MIT Sloan community. I want to thank the other faculty who participated. Uh, that's Ray Reagans and Aaron Kelly and Roberto Rigabon and Tavneet Suri. I want to alert you to the to those recordings of those uh, conversations that are on the website. And once again, let me thank Redsef Levy uh, for his time uh, and for the great work that he's doing on behalf of us all. Uh, when, uh, say say um, um, a good evening and a good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, and that everyone should be well and take good care. Bye-bye. Uh, Thanks.